Hello and welcome to Soundtracks Out of the Box session at South by Southwest. I'm Joel Mills, Senior Programme Manager for Music at British Council. The British Council is UK's cultural relations organisation, connecting artists, musicians and composers and music organisations around the world. We're delighted to be able to host this session online at South by Southwest as part of an ongoing film and music programme supporting making connections for artists and composers interested in collaborative music and film opportunities. During the COVID-19 pandemic, as many of the normal social and cultural activities have been put on pause, many of us have been glued to our TV screens more than ever. Music's absolutely vital to our experience of television to create atmosphere, anticipation, emotional connection. To delve into the world of TV music, we have three special guests with a wealth of experience to share. First, I'd like to welcome Michael Price, who's an Emmy Award winning composer and pianist from Yorkshire. He's worked on a notable array of projects as co-producer and music editor, but is perhaps best known for his scores for Dracula and Sherlock in collaboration with David Arnold. Outside of film and television, Michael is also signed to pioneering contemporary classical label, Erased Tapes. Hannah Peel is a Northern Irish artist. As well as her solo work, Hannah has worked with an array of collaborators, including orchestration and conducting for Paul Weller, an album with the Faber poet, Will Burns, and is a member of the band, The Magnetic North. She was nominated for an Emmy for her work on the Game of Thrones, The Last Watch, and has composed the soundtrack to The Deceived, a new four-part TV series. Ed Bailey is a music supervisor for film, television and advertising from independent music company Leyland Music. Music supervision projects include numerous multi-award winning advertising campaigns alongside feature film and television credits including War of the Worlds, Top Boy and Steve McQueen's film anthology Small Acts for the BBC. Each of our speakers will make an introduction to their work and some of the projects and the programmes they've worked on. We'll then follow with more of a general conversation to explore the relationship between sound, vision, and probe different approaches for scoring and creating soundtracks for TV com music commissions. So first of all, I'd like to hand over to Michael. Thanks, Joel. Um, for, for anyone who has... Uh has not come across any of the work that I've done, which is probably most people, then I think uh, it might be useful to just describe how I, how I started, because I think the, um, one of the, one of the questions that I'm, I, I imagine we'll discuss later on is, is where everybody uh, can, can catch a break in, in film and TV music as it's so competitive. But I'm one of the people who, who in a way came up through the ranks because I was, an assistant to the uh, late great Michael Kamen, who was a fantastic composer who wrote, amongst many other things, the scores to Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, and all the Lethal Weapons, and all the Die Hards, the first X Men film. And I worked with him for five years um, in the period between Event Horizon, Metallica, SM, and Band of Brothers. So that that was the sort of chronology there, and and in a way that five-year period assisting Michael in all things on the on his scores kind of um, set up a, a way of thinking about film and TV music which has, has definitely um, influenced the work that I did later later going into working as a music editor after having worked with Michael on on films like the Lord of the Rings trilogy and some rom-coms so I did uh, the first, I did Love Actually and the second Bridget Jones, uh, both of which are, are particular favourites, um, which are uh, the cutting in of songs and in a, in a way overlaps with Ed's amazing work, which, which I'm sure he'll talk about later as well. But then really in the last maybe 10 years, um, and I'm probably a bit slow off the, off, the, off the mark with this, but in the last 10 years, I think I've been uh, finding my own voice a, a bit more, both as a as a recording artist, whether that's for sort of live playing live more or uh, recording, making albums uh, with the race tapes and, um, and other uh, collaborations. Um, 
but also it felt like after having a slightly mechanical training, a practical training in the nuts and bolts of film and TV, um, I'm starting to find my own way of creating a, a, a world, a musical world for each film or each TV show that I work on, whether that's together with David Arnold or, or on my own. So um, we've, we've got little clips to, to, to break up the talking. And so I brought along a clip of, um, uh, from a film, a brilliant film directed by Craig Roberts that's just out called Eternal Beauty. And, and the reason for bringing this clip along was really just to uh, kind of set off the thread of how you create a world for, for a character. And, and this scene is uh, right at the start of the, the film when the lead character Jane played by Sally Hawkins is, is just walking. We, we haven't seen anything else from her, but um, yeah, there's it, it sort of, I guess it's an example of how you start from a, a blank piece of paper. So in a, in a way that uh, clip from Eternal Beauty is a sort of um, a, an, ex, an example of the sort of how quickly, I guess, music in general can, can create a world. In that case, two, two time periods, sort of modern day and then, and then a flashback to a, to a previous time. Um, and then the other clip um, that I've got to play as well is, is just a bit more related to what's on, is that sort of, classic interview question what's on your desk right now and what's on my desk right now is uh season four of a of a tv series called unforgotten which i i've uh written right from the start um and uh if we if we get to talk about um schedules and pressure then uh so we're in abbey road in two days time with three episodes worth to record <laughs> so that's over 100 cues um some of which are finished and some of which are signed off. So, you know, when we've, this, this is the happiest I've been for ages because I get to not write for, for an hour or two. Um, but this uh, little clip is really just a sort of a, a, a tiny slice of process. This is a, a cue from, um, I think, season two of Unforgotten, but it just shows a, a little bit of uh, where we went and make the music for, for that particular show, which is... Um, mostly the strings at Abbey Road and then a bunch of piano and synths that, that I do myself in my studio. So this little clip from, from Unforgotten.
thanks, Joel. That's definitely enough of me talking. Wow, that's really lovely to see those insights and those sweeping strings are just absolutely lush. <laughs> Thank you. There's lots to ask from that. But before we come back and have a few more questions, um, Hannah, let's turn to you for a bit of an introduction on your work as well. Yes, thank you and hello. Um, yeah, so I started out uh, being a session musician and started making records for other people actually and touring a lot until I um, started to write my own music, which was about 10, 11 years ago, uh, where I found a music box and in, in a magic shop and decided to punch some holes in some paper and make some music out of it. But um, I made a cover of Tainted Love um, and it got picked up by a little record label in Birmingham and it ended up being synced quite a lot all over the place from like American Horror Story to ITV's kind of summer soaps, adverts. Um, and it was a doorway into that kind of world that I'd always wanted to do, but I, I'd never been trained in. Um, so I kind of took that and met quite a few people, music supervisors mostly, so this will link into Ed, um, and started work writing music for kind of, I suppose, more um, adverts and commercials, um, and ended up writing quite a lot of title music for like a Channel 4 and a Netflix series um, and worked with a company called Balloon and we did a series on Channel 4 called Dates, um, which got me an RTS for the title music. Um, so I'd always kind of worked undercover whilst doing my albums. Um, and so through that, I actually met, met Jeannie Finley because she'd placed one of our tracks from the Magnetic North, the band, in one of her films called The Great Hip Hop Hoax, which was probably about seven or eight years ago now. Um, so when she started working on Game of Thrones, which for her was a good two or three year project, she got in touch and said, I'd like to work with you on the soundtrack, mainly because of the music box. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, so I recreated the title sequence to the opening so taking the original dun, 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 and doing that on the music box to accompany a tapestry and yeah that got nominated for an emmy which was amazing um and so i made that kind of transition from writing extra scenes and writing title music to actually finally actually writing scores and since then i've done a couple of documentary films like tv specials for bbc and um and then my first TV series, which was The Deceived, which came out in the summer in 2020. Um, so I think it's probably a good time to play that. Um, so this is half about the third episode in, and I, I kind of chose this one because there's a lot of string scoring and we'll, we'll probably talk about the process of that as coming at it from an artist and then having to transition into scoring quite fully for, very small budgets. <laughs> That was tense. Amazing. <laughs> well. that was brilliant. That was awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, so that, uh, I, th I think there's one thing that I've come up against actually and that has been quite a learning curve is the different styles of music that you're asked to write and the, the changes between the initial kind of concept with the production team and the director to the actual end result. 
um, that whole uh, skull for the deceived was supposed to be kind of soundscape based. <laughs> and as you can tell, it very, very quickly changed to something else um, with a very severe deadline, actually. So it was quite stressful making it. But I think it probably added to the tension. Um, and I just wanted to play you a quick example of something else. I'm no way at all trained in jazz. Uh, but when I was asked to do the documentary for Lee Miller, um, uh, you know, which spans her whole life through the kind of 1920s and 30s in Paris to um, her photography during the war and, and being there at the discovery of the Dachau concentration camp. So there was a, a massive level of different styles that were required and not being a, a jazz player at all, this was quite a new experience for me. So, um, uh, yeah, so I thought it'd be quite nice to play a bit of that. Just huge possibility. You know, Lee, first I think we'd better clear up just how you happen to be a photographer in the first place. I thought the best way was to start out studying with one of the great masters in the field, Man Ray. He was in Paris at that time, so I went to him and said, Hello, I'm your new student and apprentice. He said, oh, no, you're not. I don't have students or apprentices. I said, you do now. Wow, Hannah, that's two very different kinds of projects that you've worked on. Really exciting, very different in each of their own way. And the first clip really sort of showed how you build that tension. And then the project around Lee Miller, such a different style. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to turn now to Ed, because Ed, you've got a very different approach as a music supervisor. So it'd be great to hear from you a, a bit more about your work. And yeah, please introduce and tell us a bit more. Yeah, I, I started I started out as a musician, actually, and it was at music school when I I'd say maybe it was my final year when I started flipping over from the side of being a performer and that being my ambition to actually really enjoying the role of working with other musicians. I became a live music promoter. As a student, it didn't really go anywhere beyond doing live events, but it just meant I got to kind of collaborate with a lot of a lot of musicians and and hang out with bands, which which I enjoyed doing. And um, that led to me getting my first job within the industry. And sync was something that I had always been very aware of as a as a kind of aspiring composer and musician. But it, the world of being a music supervisor at this point, when I was kind of fresh faced out of college, wasn't really there. But I ended up operating in this world where I was representing catalog for the purposes of promoting it to a client base made up of music supervisors and editors and directors. Um, so that was a really great baptism of fire of kind of learning that process of the kind of sync pitch process and kind of how that side of the world um, operates and the kind of industry behind it all, especially within a world of music, which is designed, its sole purpose is to be used um, in film, TV, advertising. Um, from there, I, I made the jump into commercial music representation. So I, I worked at um, Blue Mountain Music for a number of years, which was Chris Blackwell's publishing company. Um, it was an incredible experience for me. It was a, a huge development platform. It was a time when I was in my early 20s working in an independent publisher in Notting Hill representing the music of Bob Marley, um, Bubba Marl, Toots and the Maytals. And I was doing that for a few years and, and um, eventually kind of moved for a brief stint over to another commercial music publisher. Again, the role there within Sync is very much, for those who don't know, within those departments is very much kind of promotional. It's, it's helping composers to um, draw that income stream of, of sync placements, but also if they have their own aspirations to work on bespoke projects, to be able to make sure that their music's been heard by the right people to, to help tap into that avenue. Um, but for me, there was, there was always this other world that over those years, I had kind of discovered this, um, this desire to lean into, and that was that, was that of music supervision. Um, 
So that's what led me to today. I mean, for 10 years now, I've been working with Abby Leland, who back then was a, was a, a client, effectively. We very much um, had a, I'd kind of say like a 85-15 split on, on advertising projects versus film and TV. We'd maybe be doing um, one, two film TV projects a year. The rest in the UK, predominantly advertising is, is kind of the, the, the biggest side of the supervision industry um, in, in the UK. And, um, and over time, we just have had the, the honour really of being able to work with really, really incredibly talented people on really exciting campaigns. I'd like to think that we're at, at the side of, of ad supervision that allows us to be really experimental and to kind of push the envelope in terms of the type of creative aspirations that we have on projects. Um, within that time, we've, we've always liked to look for artists that can create the sound within their own voice on a project rather than kind of seeking out the composer who can emulate lots of other people's voices. So it's kind of helped lead us towards really close collaboration with talent that can be kind of true to their own sound. And within that, it led to us a, a few years ago, somewhat, somewhat from missing that world of working within publishing and working super closely with composers on their career paths, um, but also just for kind of wanting to kind of tap into other new emerging areas within the UK industry over here in the uk obviously as it is internationally with things like netflix amazon etc um creating a lot more television content it's helped the industry over here boom um music supervision in general is booming over here there's a lot more roles because we're not just operating in a world of blanket licenses where editors can kind of grab whatever commercial tracks and put them in something and it's it's all kind of covered we're now working on these bigger bigger jobs and that's that's led to us working on things like Top Boy for Netflix and Formula One Drives to Survive for Netflix and then uh, most recently um, Small Axe for, for Stephen Queen. And, um, so yeah, it's a super exciting time for us and, and something that, that, that I'm really kind of excited for the future. Um, I do have a clip. I mean, I, I, I guess before playing this, I just wanted to maybe say that how the music supervisor role I guess what it encapsulates, because I think there are certain, um, maybe certain misconceptions about how uh, how much of a gatekeeper role it is, um, when actually it's a really collaborative role and the, that's designed to creatively inspire and enable the best possible realization of a director's vision, rather than being the people that get to decide as that last line what track sits on what what scene. Um, the role is definitely more that of, um, I'd say kind of threefold. Firstly, creative, yes, helping find tracks, helping find composers, um, helping build the sonic world and identity of a production. And that is a, within itself a collaborative process because it's tapping into the writer and the director's vision of, of what this project should sound like. Um, secondly, I'd say it's logistical. It's um, the booking of musicians, of, of recording studios, um, establishing soundtrack album release partners, um, making sure that the composer is looked after through the process and, and, and has access to the tools and the means that they have to make something happen. When we're doing on-set recordings, making sure that the sound recordist is tapped into the, the deliverables that we're going to get to them um, to make sure that that can all work well on set. And then thirdly, I'd say it's kind of the, the budgeting and contracting, the kind of the, the legal side of it and the budget side of it, negotiating license deals, score composer deals, managing the overall music budget. So there, there's a lot, there's a lot of hats to it, to the role and one which, you know, we get to kind of neighbor the processes that, that Michael and Hannah would would experience um, and then a few kind of other things to hopefully make that as smooth for them as possible when they're working on on a production. Um, yeah, the, the clip that I've brought along is just from a, a, 
uh, as Michael said, the, the thing that's under the desk, the most one of the most recent uh, projects um, that I've um, had the honor of working on, actually. And this this is uh, the trailer for the first film within Steve McQueen's five film anthology, um, Small Axe. On Sunday, the 9th of August in North Kensington, a demonstration took place against the police, which degenerated into totally inexcusable violence. There may be some who believe that they have been the victim of injustice at the hands of the police. Others who, like parasites, feed on these beliefs and seek to turn them to their own advantage, deliberately creating hate and violence. These defendants are all guilty of the serious criminal offence. This attack on a black establishment is not an isolated event, but a sustained campaign against black people. And today we are saying enough is enough. Thanks, Ed. That's really interesting. That's such a powerful series as well. And uh, I hope we can hear a bit more from you on that in a, a short while. Um, something that struck me was from here, listening to all three of you, was just that you've all been on a bit of a journey, haven't you, in terms of your work and the things that you've been doing, building on each other um, to what you're doing now and sort of, this sort of cumulative experience, you know, and growth that's sort of um, obviously a really important part of what you do. So I wondered if you could talk, if we could talk a little bit more about how that's come about and about getting commissions and the sort of commissioning process a little bit. And uh, particularly you know, for our audience, if you have any kind of tips and anecdotes um, Michael and Hannah, uh, it would be really great perhaps to start with um, a sort of a few insights about that commissioning process and how you then sort of take that and the approach to scoring music for TV. Hannah, can I start with you? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I guess just going slightly back to what you were just first saying about being on a journey, um, I think coming at it as coming at to where I am right now, I've always wanted to be in this place right now, but I was met with a lot of closed doors. And um, one of the first things I, I wanted to do about, this is about 12 years ago, is I applied to do a film and TV masters in at the Royal College of Music. Um, but I'd, even though I'd got a kind of first degree, it was at a performing arts college in Liverpool called Lippa. Um, I wasn't accepted after the interview because the reason they gave me was because I didn't have the classical training that was needed to be on this course. Um, and, you know, my scores were looked over by a composer and, you know, I had, I was, work, when I was at Lipper, I worked and uh, my uh, lecturer was Gary Carpenter, the wonderful classical composer and Wickerman MD from back in the day. Um, so it was really heartbreaking, but somebody rang me from the college that was doing the interview and said you have a sound and although you haven't got the training to to get into the college and be at the same level as the other students uh, you should keep developing that sound so that was when I made the decision to kind of go right I'm going to develop my own voice and I'll I'll make records and I'll do what I know best so throughout the whole journey there has been barriers and there's always been a, a closed door and I would say to anyone that is feeling that um that journey of youth where you want it now <laughs> and mm -hmm. that kind of impatience that there is always a way around and sometimes it takes time to develop something that maybe you can't see but when you know when I look back now over the 10 years I kind of go yeah I wasn't quite ready and I had to find something that kept it unique to me um and I guess in some ways those doors that are opening now for commissions uh a lot easier because of the Game of Thrones because I, I had a sound and now I've got an agent it's a lot easier to to be put forward for things I would say it's still not an easy task I still get asked quite regularly do you think you're up for this do you think you can do it no matter how many 
things I've scored or orchestrated or worked with Paul Weller, I still get asked that question. Um, so That's I think, you know, those barriers, although they are, they are there in the industry, they do help if you are willing to be persistent and consistent, they do help you adapt. And what you were saying about how the two different sounds that I have are so different, I've had to learn how to make those different sounds in order to survive and make a living out of, out of this industry. Yeah, so I just wondered, did you ever feel then that some of the commissions that you got were a huge leap? And is it more just a thing of accepting those and finding a way to fulfill them a bit like working on the jazz, the Lee Miller? Yeah, yeah, I'm just going for it. And, you know, although I'm absolutely riddled with fear, just having that thing of like, okay, I know this, I know music, I've played it for years, I know I've got training. And also, uh, Michael, the probably the nicest man in the industry I've ever met, uh, ringing him and saying, <laughs> Ten <pounds>. can, <laughs> can you help me? Can you advise me? What do I do? You know, having access to that, um, no matter how small it is, is, is so helpful. It's a reminder that you are not necessarily on your own. And actually, I think the, the Coffee Break series that Michael did was a real kind of discovery that not one person has the same journey. It is all, everyone's so different. It's amazing. Yeah, thank you. Michael, maybe that's a bit of a cue for you to talk about the composer's oh. coffee break. <laughs> and it's basically just down emerge. And, and it'd be also good to sort of tie into thinking about if you had any of those moments, you know, sort of leaps and how your experience accumulate, you know, I suppose sort of grew. Yeah, I think firstly on the composer coffee break um, videos, they're still all on YouTube. There's a, basically a dozen videos that would would um, uh, I made a series of Zoom calls with friends who were composers, which Hannah very kindly uh, was on one of the very first ones, and um, it, it was basically an attempt to just just keep everybody chatting during the first lockdown. So we did them, started them in, in March 2020, and um, I, I found it a really humbling process, particularly because we could get to, I could get to chat to my friends and colleagues in a way that we we don't often get a, a chance. We, we see each other in the corridors of studios, or you know, and the kind of we're all, we're always rushing past each other. And so it was a chance just to just to reflect and ask some of the questions of, you know, of, of a great variety of composers whether it was sort of artists like Anushka Shankar, for instance, who's, who's amazing, or, or then people that you'd know more as composers. So Stephen Price, who got the Oscar for Gravity, or Oliver Arnold, or, you know, a whole bunch of amazing people. And, um, yeah, I'd, I'd, I would encourage, if, if anybody has got 12 hours to, to kill at any point, to, to, to uh, check some of those out on, on, on YouTube. Just because I think... I, from what Hannah was saying, I think there's two super important points um, that that come out from from how she describes things. One is that there, everybody is different, and and it really is. It, if anyone is is looking for this kind of secret sauce, or the you know the kind of the the uh, how to get successful by numbers, then the more people you talk to, the more that disappears like a mirage because everybody is different and and as soon as you think oh i should be a composer assistant because that's what michael did you'll realize that that doesn't work for a lot of people or i should do my own records like hannah did first and then you realize that doesn't work for a lot of people as well because i think behind uh, each person's story there is this quality of authenticity that I think is the sort of the, the prior quality. And when people are authentically approaching the, the area of, of writing music for film and TV in the way that's right for them, then that is the right way for them to do it. If, if that doesn't sound sort of incredibly uh, circular. Um, and so for for me the the root of being a, a composer assistant which i think most people would would say you are the try and be an artist first and then cross over as hannah has done brilliantly because then you have a voice and and the um 
the respect that your solo work or your band work has done opens the door for filmmakers to want you to be part of their project. Or on the other hand, you learn your craft by assisting someone who is already doing the job and you kind of learn it from the ground up. And they both have got very clear sort of pros and cons. The one is if you're an artist first, then the practicalities of knocking out a 10 part Netflix series in, in three months, it, you know, it, there's a bunch of stuff to know. It is incredibly technical and incredibly fast and incredibly sort of, um, uh, I think it is just a shock to a shock to the system if you've not been in, in that role before. But then on the other hand, if you did as I did, which was subjugate my ego, and believe me, it's a, it is a huge ego, <laughs> subjugate my ego to, to Michael Kamen's in the first instance for, for five years, because that's what the best assistants do. They make themselves utterly transparent around and serve the project and serve the composer that they're working for and with. And then as a music editor, again, it's it's not about you. It really is about either serving the composer if it's a score-led film or if it's if it's a song-based film, then, you know, you, the, the, the very best music editing and editors is, is utterly invisible. It just feels like that was how it should always have been. And so I think for, for me, the, the challenge then was to find the... Uh, so reconnect in a way with the musician that I was when I was 21 in my 30s and 40s, um, which that has been a, a, a fantastic exploration for me. And one that continues as well, because I still can revert to problem solving and just fixing stuff, which which gets it across the line. But yeah, yeah. It it sounds like what you're both saying in a way is that the important bit is the journey, but the individual approach. And there's no, there's no one sort of sort of way of developing that sort of professional career. It's going to be down to your, your, you know, your, your sense of yourself as an artist as well. Um, it's really interesting as well, because what you're also saying is that it's very dependent, a different way of working from, uh, working as an artist individually you're working to a commission and uh, there's I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about that and about what the sort of considerations and approaches um, you have as it working as part of a team who else are you kind of working closely with well I, I mean I think for for me the there's a couple of things that were said to me very early on which unlocked the the door um for what your position in the pecking order is and that is mostly that you're sort of um you're often referred to as a head of department and that make makes you sort of on a on a level a decision making level with maybe the editor or the cinematographer or the production designer and really you are part of a large collaborative team who are trying to serve the uh, serve the story and ser serve the project as, as as well as you can. Now, I think that means, in terms of where you start and when the commission comes in, then there's usually a bit of um, sort of uh, there's a, a waltz that happens at the start of a project where um, you might be down to a short list, and then there might be some demoing that goes on and however much and i'm sure hannah will have have uh, participated in this process as well however much you think well just go and listen to the go to hmv and buy some stuff why do i have to demo for your project the uh in a way what what that is for me now is a is a chance to um experience communicating with the director it's not so much about whether you wrote a good tune or not or scored a scene because you don't even know often how the scene fits into into the show as a whole or the film as a whole but what it is is a sort of an, a, an invitation to try and make a connection and and if you can make that connection um then almost always the demo gets scrapped anyway it's, it's really not about that it's can we work together is is a, is a relationship to be had 
Yeah, so it's about the dynamic in the relationship as well. Ed, I want to turn to you on this as well, because I'd love to hear more about working with the team on small acts. That series had some real moments of TV magic, I think, and was very powerful. And it, it, from the sounds of it, it's made up of a, a, a group um, of very dynamic people. Can you maybe tell us a bit more about working on that and some of the considerations um, that you, Michael, spoke of around sort of working with other people's vision, like Steve McQueen? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, so so with um, Small Acts, it was, you know, all productions have... Um, have their kind of their, their figure who is guiding the the vision the the real kind of creative leader and you can't get one who's more inspiring or stronger than that of Stephen Queen um his focus and his um drive his his kind of deep um grilling and understanding of his subject matter is kind of second to none from anyone that I've had the pleasure of working with um and as he kind of guides and steers the ship, he also um, surrounds himself with with people to help inspire and bring the right um, right expertise to the table. So, so with that, we had um, Mika Levi doing the original score. Uh, Mika worked on the first film, Mangrove, and 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 their collaboration with Steve was that of a very um how 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 do we get that visceral um that that real dirt under the fingernails um feeling of protest like how do you get in the space how do you make people feel the tension in the air the kind of palpable um uh, uprising um actually coming into the music um and Mika had an amazing way of of approaching that in a way that was true to to instrumentally their world, but then also not um, uh, not not kind of detaching from the film. It all it all kind of merged in beautifully to something that would fit. You know, there was talk of you know using kind of mento guitars and and kind of instruments that are natural instruments, wood instruments, and making sure that that all connected in. And you know, we ended up on guitar and and very little in the way of electronics um which you may hear on some other scores that Mika's worked on but that that collaborative process that kind of measure multiple times and then cut multiple times <laughs> approach to film score um definitely works best when everyone is just very clear and open and honest at, at every kind of stage because you know we've all we've all seen people get hired and fired on jobs. We've all seen people get hired because of their unique sound and then lose the job because of their own unique sound. Um, and just all of the different kind of things that come with battling reference tracks that are kind of sitting on as, as, as cues that people get temp love. And, um, but really the rewarding process on something like Small Axe is the embracing of multiple people's visions and all kind of coming together in this kind of Venn diagram of where is the, the sweet spot? Like where, where do I lean to this person's idea? When, where do they lean to mine? And, and where do we kind of, kind of find that perfect sweet spot in the middle? And it really was the kind of culmination of, you know, the editor trying out various references and then them being reinterpreted in different ways and certain songs that were scripted, not being viable. So then having to kind of dig deep for, for alternatives that could spark a similar magic. And even sometimes rolling off impromptu moments with cast members on set that you never saw coming and didn't plan for, didn't license the music appropriately in advance because of, but then this moment happens and you've got to capture it. And then you go, okay, let's find out later on if we can use it that way um, because it's too magical to, to replace. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a kind of constantly evolving creative process where no one person is uh, is is you know it, it, one person is the final say, but there's there's kind of no one person who kind of should 
you know, go yeah. Lone Ranger on it. <laughs> it's the, so it's the team working towards it as a, uh, you know, in a dynamic kind of way, toing and froing. Um, one more thing on Small Axe, Lovers Rock was mm. one of those sort of very special sort of TV moments, largely because it focused around one song. Can you tell us a little bit about that as well? Um, yeah, I mean, musically, I, I, I'd say in many ways, Small Axe is a bit of a music supervisor's dream. And it's certainly, for someone, as I said earlier on, came from a reggae publisher. But it's, um, you know, we we had about 130 songs in Small Axe. This, this is effectively a limited series of five what you could call episodes and lovers rock itself has close to 40 music cues in there uh, no original score all licensed songs and there's a couple of moments um like the janet k silly games use which it's kind of funny because the first time i'm sat there watching that back it's a it's an 11 minute 30 second use of one song and after working on something for at this point coming up to about 18 months nearly two years um it's hard to know how much that is um a mad idea <laughs> is everyone gonna look at this and go what on earth have you just been kind of scurrying away and doing your own thing or whether it's going to be the magic that it kind of felt like it was the first time you watched it and then on the fifth time, you're like, is that still okay that this is 11 minutes long? Um, and I'm so glad that the vision was stuck with because it's the moment that everybody, everyone talks about. And I think it's because it's relatable. I think it's um, the magic of, of Lover's Rock for me, and this is something that we discussed with Steve really early on, is, is that of evoking nostalgia. It's... Um, speaking to the people who went to those parties or evoking the era and the feeling and the, the music and, and the atmosphere for those who didn't or those who wanted to or their older brother went there but they never got to. Um, and I, th I think that's why it's so successful is because a lot of people can relate to it or you can watch it and it just feels like you're there. It feels like you're in the room. Even if you didn't go to blues parties in the late 70s, early 80s, you went to parties at some point or you've been to some kind of disco or club or whatever your musical experience has been. Um, it's a similar purpose. It's a similar social atmosphere. It's a similar reason uh, to that, those events. Yeah, it was very evocative of that being in the moment of music and... Um, quite groundbreaking because it felt like it brought cinema to the sort of TV screen as well. Yeah, and I kind of that... say that it's, um, sorry, I just, I just kind of say as well that the timing, which was obviously down to, you know, not circumstances anyone was prepared for, but the timing of everyone being locked at home and then actually having this deeply intimate social atmosphere being portrayed on television really resonated with a lot of people for something that we were missing and longing for and then it was captured so well by the director on screen that it actually kind of helped propel the viewers love for that thing because of nostalgia it kind of made us all realize what we were missing at that point it time. captured a real moment of black british culture in the 70s and 80s as well and dealt with some of the issues around racism so it was really powerful i want to come on to talk a bit more relating to that about music and memory and association. And um, Hannah and Michael, you've both worked with um, TV programs that have a, a sort of story or narrative that kind of existed before. So Hannah, I wanted to ask you about working on um, the Game of Thrones, The Last Watch. And and how much um, you, you mentioned having to sort of, you know, I suppose, change the theme a little bit and how much you sort of draw on sort of prior associations and how much you want to kind of challenge any existing associations and with unexpected approaches. Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, I guess one of the things that came up 
was that I had never seen Game of Thrones <laughs> prior <laughs> to getting the job. So my first job was to binge watch the whole thing, which took me through the whole of the summer of 2018. Um, <laughs> so that was quite an experience. But yeah, I picked up quite a lot of things of the, of the musical score, which is so resonant with a lot of people and the power behind it. Um, and my first delivery of, of demos to Jeannie and, and uh, the, the team were, were very much dramatic and bombastic and had synthesizers and my own kind of take on something and very quickly realized that it was not going to work whatsoever um the and so you know apart from the kind of the theme tune being used for at the very beginning that's that's really the only kind of hint i guess in in, in a melody wise to kind of you know tune people into the story and um, what was really important for that documentary was that because it was shot in northern ireland um the weather conditions were horrific at times they were out in the snow, they were in freezing rain for hours on end. Um, and there was a lot of stories behind the scene of people working on something for 10 years and then getting to the end of that 10 years and being with a, a family um, or missing their own family because they've had to work for months on end. Um, so there was a lot more handmade and acoustic feel to some to things. So the only thing I kind of hinted at musically in the end was... Um, the use of the cello. Um, the original composer uses a lot of low end strings and cellos led up double basses. And so I took quite a few moments with piano and just used the cello um, as, a, as a kind of a tool in order to kind of connect to the original series. And, and I think it worked. Yeah. yeah so, so you keep some of those connections going through and introduce lots of new things. Michael, what about you with Sherlock Holmes and Dracula? Because those were both very groundbreaking new ways of telling those stories, but one that people are familiar with. So how did you approach that musically? And yes. Yeah, I, th I think both of, both of those projects had got a very interesting kind of interaction with the, with the culture at large in that the i think sherlock holmes is something like i get this wrong but he is one of the most filmed literary characters ever certainly sort of like top five mm -hmm. closely followed by dracula so there there are endless versions of what sherlock holmes looks like sounds like how he would act and then in a film and tv sense what sort of music would accompany him same with Dracula but in a way the freedom that David Arnold and I gave ourselves was to in a way because there's so many then there isn't one Dracula theme in the same way really there is a Superman theme we know what it is it's John Williams's theme that's Superman but Dracula hmm, I'm not I'm not so sure there's there's some amazing scores out there but I don't think there's there's one that's made it into the culture and, um, and and in a way, the, the the two projects, the first of all, there was the reference point of of what parts of the culture are we tapping into? What references are we uh, we accommodating in our music? There's actually there's a special episode of uh, Sherlock, which is set in Victorian times. And we actually we do quote um, one of one of the earlier Sherlock themes for for about for four bars and as as ed will well know that's we, <laughs> the paperwork on that was probably more than for the rest of the entire score but the uh but with our sherlock because we did it for 10 years and the show nothing to do with music but the show is incredibly successful it started it, it made a dent on culture itself so now when we go around you know, if I, if I travel for any reason, then people will hum the music from Sherlock back to you or will send us it on, you know, on via Twitter, <laughs> sometimes with a nice message, sometimes less so. But the uh, there's there's this sense now that, and particularly because we haven't done the show for a few years, then that is, it sort of exists out in the almost like folk music that, that 
we might have created in the in the first place but very quickly it goes away from you and becomes other people's absorbed into other people's cultural life whether they've got it as the ringtone on their phone or you know whether they do arrangements of it in their school concerts um so that was fascinating in a way to to sort of throw throw some tunes into the 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 cultural pond and uh dracula interesting it there's only been one series no one knows whether there'll, there'll be any more so it doesn't feel like necessarily we made much of a cultural splash with that one certainly compared to sherlock but but i think it is it is fascinating because both film and tv the music for it for whatever reason if something catches hold it becomes very much a part a very personal part of people's own musical memory yeah thank you that's really interesting and it's you know it's true that once you've made these things they're out in the world um for people to enjoy as well um i want to ask you as well about that sort of balance you mentioned orchestration earlier hannah and michael both of you seem you know work as artists recording your own music and i wondered if you'd talk a little bit about the music influences you're drawing on. Um, I think you're both tinkerers, aren't you? As well as working <laughs> with orchestras. And I, I wonder- I'm not if... even sure I get to that, those dizzying heights. <laughs> <laughs> tinkerers, <laughs> yeah. Um, but I wonder if you just kind of talk a little bit to each of you on that sort of balance um, about what repertoire and, uh, Sort of influences that you're drawing on for your work. Hannah, do you want to start first? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, tinkering, I would say part of the whole <laughs> process of being a musician or an artist or anything is tinkering and playing and having that that uh, that side of you. Um, and what I found actually, you know, listening and, and working in film and TV is that playful side of it is is the most fun side of it, you know, like going to a house and capturing the sounds and making that into the soundscapes of the deceived to, to create a bed to write music on top of. And I think that kind of element of it is the exciting part for me, is the the play and the the joy of finding a new instrument that you can explore and and make mistakes on. And sometimes those mistakes are the are the thing that sticks. Um, I guess both Michael and me are both into synthesizers and sounds and soundscapes that you can create from from there and where you can take them. And the use of orchestration on top of that is always a balance, uh, you know, between even in records, finding that balance between, for me anyway, the electronic and acoustic instruments is always a, 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 another kind of discovery um, into something new and otherworldly. And, you know, I guess with making records, you are making a story um, as well. It's it's just not set to film or TV or visuals, but you, you have a narrative. And when you go to press, there is always a narrative to a, a record and be that kind of historical or be that that you've a story that you've completely invented on your own. There is a narrative for people to talk about. And I think that's the, um, the exciting thing. So I guess influences wise, like, I, I can't say there's like one thing because everything is so different all the time. But I guess, you know, my kind of go-to person is Bernard Herrmann in, in terms of like scoring, in terms of sound, when you think of like the birds, not in terms of like obviously current sounds, but as a as a point of reference and, and a strong point of reference and a reminder of always trying to create something for me that is is beautiful and has beauty to it be that for a horror film or be that for something that is a lot more lyrical I still think that it should be beautiful at the end of the day and that for me is always the 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 mission in some senses I think beauty is important thank you Michael well I I think for for me just thinking about the artist versus sort of film tv compose a bit I think previously, I, th I think you were you were either on one side of the fence or the other, and then you could tentatively sort of like reach over and and often God 
bless people who started on my side of the fence in film and TV, when they tried to do their own projects later in life, they were terrible. And they would let you, know, you know, they know that, I know that, we all know that. Because in a, in a way, you know, that it's sort of, if you give people too much money, a house in Surrey and your kids in private school, that doesn't necessarily generate the right conditions to write something authentic. And, and that's something I'm very aware of. Um, but someone coming from Hannah's background, but also with the skill set and the aesthetic and the intelligence that she's got, I think it starts to make those those sort of binary differences just just redundant. You, you become a or, or, or you aspire to be a complete artist. And that means that you, as, as an artist, you might be collaborating on a an installation in a gallery, on a piece of choreography, on a piece of film, on a solo. There's always collaboration in whatever it is that you're that you're doing, unless even if it's a solo. I mean, I've been doing a solo album on the. I've got a little unicord, a single string piano thing here in the studio. I've been doing a, a, some solo tracks on that, but it's still a collaborative process. Somebody else needs to mix it. I need to talk about direction and the. The sort of you know the narrative behind it yeah so drawing from lots of different pools and colors in a palette and it's really interesting um i'm a little bit conscious of time so i think we i want to sort of move on and talk a little bit about the future um ed you know I, what's the current context looking like you know what are the sort of challenges and opportunities given we've all been in lockdown for a while um yeah i mean it's it's, it's obviously it's a difficult time for film and television production in terms of um being able to get out there and film um, the insurance hurdles and, and all of the things that come with it because of uncertainty but having said that i've certainly seen a lot of production companies and through the willingness of really great distributors and broadcasters doing everything that they can to support those production companies to get this stuff made. Um, and, you know, we're working to odd lengths now with collaborative writing sessions, having COVID tests before you meet people in the studio. I can't tell you how many tests I've had now at this point. And, you know, similarly for recording sessions, getting musicians into the room, you can't have as many in the studio as, as previously when recording in, in places like London. But, um, but we're getting there and, and working it out. And, and thankfully, with the, all of the will and hard work of production companies, I think, and also the, the fact that the audience is in no way slowing demand-wise, if anything, it's, it's, we're consuming more content than ever we've got far less going on in our social lives other than Netflix, Amazon and iPlayer. So we, we, we need this entertainment. Um, so, you know, it's an exciting time, I think, really. It's just one that comes with its own difficulties. But also, I think, for certainly for original score, we're at this point where I think there's more work than ever um, coming up and on the horizon. So, I'm, yeah, I'm super excited about what's coming up really. as a positive part of the future yeah so for composers and artists there's plenty of opportunities perhaps around the corner Michael what about you you were talking about going into Abbey Road in the next few days how's lockdown working for you uh yeah it was debilitatingly strange for the first between sort of March and September last year I didn't write a note which is the longest I've never written for since I was 13 apparently mm -hmm. and um it's strange uh, as i said socially distant sessions are very weird you have to have fewer players in a bigger studio there are lots of time limitations um or just all the normal social interaction of of the collaborations that we've been talking to i i find i i really miss i mean i'm very fortunate that it's the it's a, a returning team the same director same producers for for all four seasons and we've we've sort of we've we've been through some battles uh, with each other already, so we, we know how the the ground the ground lies, and we're we're all very good friends now. But I think it would be very difficult to start a new project without just some of the human interaction, without meeting someone in the flesh, without having a you know going for a drink 
whatever the going for a walk whatever the thing is that that you do with that um with that person how about you how's how's it been working for you in lockdown yeah I, it's been it's been funny because i started broadcasting uh like maybe six months before the first lockdown hit in march last year so um actually that was my one bit of sanity that kept me going because i was searching for music and programming music for radio three um and i also had time i just finished you know, Lee Miller and The Deceived, which kind of crossed over each other. So I'd had five months of utter chaos. So I actually had planned to take off kind of April and May anyway. So it did kind of time well. I would, you know, go back to what Michael was saying about meeting people in the flesh. Mm. Um, I can't count the amount of Zoom interviews I've done with people I've never met and they've not been successful because, you know, you do need, you do need to meet humans and you do need to work with directors very closely and producers and gain that trust. And I'm not finding a TV, a screen between us is working that well, no matter how much, uh, you know, how we talk or so, you know, there's a couple of projects I'm working on a Netflix documentary genie again, which is really exciting. So that'll be finished by the summer. Um, but, you know, meeting new people has been a bit more of a struggle and, and more of a challenge for sure. Yeah, it really highlights, doesn't it, the importance of making connections and the relationships that you build. And mm. and all of you um, in your journey seem to have, uh, those seem to have been absolutely vital and core to those. Um, literally, a very quick ask, just to sort of finish on, what would be your f- uh, dream future project, Ed? Top of your head. God. <laughs> <laughs> Glad it's you first, Ed. That's all. Right. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Dream project: a live-action version of the raccoons. Um, <laughs> I oh god, you know what? I think like following following on from small, from small acts, which was one of those things that was. Um, quite a dream to work with an Oscar-winning director. It's kind of quite hard to find oh, things of, of yeah, quite hard to top at things of such uh, cultural relevance, but. Um, I, I love working on era pieces where you get to kind of throw yourself into a specific time and culture. Um, so it would be all the more exciting to be able to do something within that space on a on a Hollywood budget where you kind of get to be unshackled um, somewhat by um, by music selections and, and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, that's that's definitely a world that I take a lot of pleasure in operating in. So that's that's, that's that sounds a very good ballpark ask, Hannah. <laughs> yeah, I I know I, my I would love to be going to Abbey Road. <laughs> Come on, get <laughs> and, and having get a, large, a, a larger <laughs> budget that was larger than a string quartet would be the dream scenario. But um, like well, the one thing that the Deceived did for me was it opened a door into kind of more psychological and the thriller side which I absolutely adore and and I you know I really get a thrill from doing so if yeah if I could work on a kind of international thriller psychological drama with a bit of murder and have (laughs) a huge budget that I can have an orchestra in an Abbey Road that would be like the the key the the beautiful thing (laughs) that would give you something to really get your teeth into yeah what about you Michael what I, for me, I think I don't know if it's the same for Hannah. The the one of the triggers is when I hear somebody who plays or sings really beautifully, of which there are there are so many. Then that always sort of uh, then kind of triggers me to really sort of imagine music, imagine the music I would write for that group or for or for that singer or for that player. And so I think I think for me the the dream project would would probably not be a film or tv would project but would be a a, like a live project where i got to collect together all the people whose playing i absolutely love and just and make a big like two hour thing for them that would have just lots and lots of random joy in it Um, (laughs) yes that's what i would like to do i think random joy is a great note to end on and uh i know that tv has bringing been bringing a lot of people a lot of joy so 
thanks to all of you for your time and really interesting to hear all of your different perspectives on uh, creating music for TV. So thank you um, to our guests, Michael Price, Hannah Peel, Ed Bailey. Thank you. Thanks, John. Bye for now. 